Thank you, thank you, and welcome everybody to the next installment of the P2 podcast. Again, you have myself and Bryce back again to discuss some more just like uh, controversial topics. It's actually a really, really cool installment that we started last segment. So if you have not listened to it, go ahead and jump back and listen to it. It will kind of give some um, foreshadowing, some context to what it is we're trying to accomplish here. I think that we as a community definitely have a lot of um, of our own opinions that we don't always share. And so trying to and you know share ours and encourage others to do the same and have constructive dialogue around them is the point here. So definitely just uh, tune in, let us know your thoughts, uh, listen to us anywhere, any platform that will take our money. That is Spotify, Apple Music. You can watch our pretty mugs here on YouTube. Uh, let us know what you think, comment, leave us some more ideas, things you want to talk about, things that you want us to talk about. And uh, we'll obviously make sure we try to do our best to incorporate it. So thank you and welcome. Shit. I immediately regretted letting you do that intro. Shit dragged on forever, bro. Um, <laughs> all right. Yeah, let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, definitely kind of piggybacking off of what you said. Uh, I think that whenever we get into like really deep conversations sometimes off of seemingly like innocuous topics, it ends up being really really good and then we had to cut ourselves off early so i think that um we kind of just want a game plan for our natural tendencies and start off with something and then just kind of allow the conversation to go wherever it might go um but with that being said i'm gonna let you start this time since last time i started uh all right chris so what is a another controversial belief that you have yeah so um it's funny because we were just discussing this morning and i was like dude i'm like we don't like you said in the last episode, we don't have a ton of beliefs that I think you and I would be so far either from each other or from everyone else, right? I think that eventually because um, we're just really, really smart and everyone likes us, that they would eventually agree with us with our reasoning and the logic we would put forth. And it's like, okay, like it, it kind of presents itself in a unrefutable, you know, uh, illustration. I don't know. Um, either way. But I, my thought, I don't know, I just lost my train of thought there for a second. But either way, my 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 thought this morning uh, is actually one that's been kind of, I've been writing it in different variations uh, for the past like three or four weeks, and I want to make a post about it. And I know it'll piss some people off, so I'm like, yeah, I want to put it in context. But then I was like, you know what? After our last episode, and then talking this morning, I'm like, ah, oh, fuck it. Um, so I'll start with obviously the the clickbaity version of my my thought, and that is... On the road to games, your nutrition doesn't matter that much. And I put that in quotes. I can pause here and I can keep going in. Um, or I can ask if you understand what it is I'm getting at here. I think I do. But I would love for you to go into more detail there. For sure. No. Um, so my thought process here is that obviously we... You know, you rewind 10 years, you're looking at uh, a nation that for the most part just thought, like, if I go to the gym, I'll get jacked. If I just keep showing up, eventually I can wear stringers. If I just keep showing up, eventually I'll get delts, I'll get buys, I'll get an ass or whatever it is. Like for, I guess back then it probably wasn't about asses for girls, it was about getting skinny and having thigh gaps. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was one of those things where, like, people just wanted to show up. It was where they were lacking was in the kitchen. You know, the whole, like, abs are made in the kitchen thing, right? Like, and it was really important. And it, it definitely illustrates the pendulum swing that is America, that is society, where now I think training's taken a backseat to for for a lot of people, right? Because like if anyone comes, I mean, anyone who doesn't know the fitness space, I don't know about you, but if they come to me, especially anyone in my community, like minority community, they come to me, they hey, listen, let me get a meal plan, bro. I'm like, go to the gym. <laughs> like just go to the fucking gym. Like let's let's start there. Um because if I give you a meal plan, chances are you won't follow it anyway because you haven't developed the the disciplinary uh, habits, you know, to keep yourself uh, accountable to any level of regimen or routine. And on top of that, like, you want to look like me. Most of what I've done is actually not in the kitchen. Most of what I've done is a lot of fucking hard work in the gym, making sure I'm eating enough food. You know, I'm not starving myself. I am, you know, at least you know, intentional that aspect and make sure that I'm consuming enough so that I could grow in those phases when I was really trying to grow and that I could stay strong in those phases when I was really trying to gain strength. 
but I wasn't in there like dialing things up and, you know, using beakers and shit, making sure that my nutrition was on point. I was training really fucking hard often. Yeah. Um, and I think that's taken a way, way, way back of the bus back seat and nutrition's now driving the fucking bus. And so now you have like, I mean, I'll, I'll be frank, like you have a lot of, especially in the bodybuilding space, right? Prep coaches, they don't focus on training. They focus on diet. And that's cool because I think that diet for a lot of people can be the most difficult part, especially as you get down to the nitty gritty, right? Those last six to four weeks, shit gets tight, you know, when to put in refeeds, how to continue to, you know, you know, drive someone deeper into this deficit, lean them out, condition them, peak them properly. There's a science to it, but there's definitely some nuance to it. And it's a pretty critical time for a lot of people. Um, it's not so much that I think that the job there is super, super difficult so much as it is that I think that there is a lot of complexity and nuance that comes with working with a person in that brain space and that susceptible space, et cetera. But then they get lean and that's just it. They're just lean um, because they were following some arbitrary plan. They're just showing up in the gym. They're not really training hard, um, which is why I think that like, obviously the partnership between us and BA has worked out really well for a lot of athletes. Um, but like, it is disheartening, like seeing athletes on stage who are like just skinny and lean. And I'm just like, bro, like you are not training. Like you are just showing up to the gym and moving some shit around, like kicking shit around the gym. And I think for me, it's become increasingly more, I don't say frustrating because for the most part, people do it doesn't really bother me. Like fuck them. I don't really care. But yeah. when people come and ask me questions, it's like, dude, like I promise you that diet's important. But I also guarantee you that you are not working a fraction of hard enough in the gym. Why do you think that clients or trainees are more drawn to nutrition over training? And then why do you think that coaches are more drawn to being nutrition specialty coaches or prep specialty coaches and really relegating training to like a, a second class citizen like what what do you think that comes from that's good i um <clears throat> so i think it depends on the classification of of person and i think for me in both spaces there so both the trainee and the coach um for the trainee i think that most people think they understand training i think most people think they know what they're doing right they're like and most people think Training's the fun part. I don't mind going to the gym. No one has to encourage me or coach me and get me out of bed to go do the fun shit at the gym. Well, for athlete, let's, for athletes. let's clarify that. For, for athletes. I mean, I, I would I would say even for the majority of society, if you're telling, hey, you are a sedentary whatever person, what can I encourage you to do more? Cook your food and plan ahead or go to the gym. And most of them will say, I'll go to the gym. Like I'll, I'll do that. I'd, I'd rather do that there's more flexibility in physical activity than there is in nutrition. You know, like you can, you can be active swimming, walking, playing a sport, um, fucking going to the gym, rock climbing. Like, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can be active and burn calories and get stronger, get more fit. But yeah, obviously nutrition is a little bit more bound. It's, I would say it's definitely, um, definitely not as, like you said, fun, not as fun for most people continue. Yeah. No, no, hundred no, percent. Um, and so I think that's probably the the number one reason why it gets kind of relegated to the, the back of the bus by clients, by trainees coming in for coaches. I think it has to do again, twofold one. I think they devalue some coaches devalue training because they don't look at it from the client's perspective, they look at it from this perspective. They go, well, the gym is the easy part. Like, I know what I'm doing. Like, if I just give you something, you'll just go to the gym and you'll do it. And they assume intelligence, I guess I should say, they assume knowledge. You know, I'm not saying they're not intelligent, they don't know, but they assume their clients have this knowledge already. They will go to the gym and do what's necessary. And if they just keep showing up enough that they will get better, which is not, you know, false, right? I, I think it's all about also how quickly you want them to get better, right? Like, if they show up enough, they will get better. Uh, but if you want to be a good coach, your job is to help them get better as fast as possible. Uh, but then there's also, I think, the the shape-shifting idea, right? The idea that I think people probably quickly stopped once 
we as a community, as a society, that being like America, the world, whatever, realized that the gym wasn't enough to to get a six pack. You know, the gym wasn't enough to grow. That like diet was really important. Instead of bringing diet into the fold of our intense love for fitness and just saying, hey, like let's add this and get better, we go, oh, we don't need the gym as much. We don't need to focus on that as much. We'll go, we'll, we'll go over here. Focus on this. Diet's the most important piece. Without diet, nothing happens. It's like, yeah, without the gym, nothing happens either. Like without intense, hard, intentional training, nothing happens. You can't have one without the other and expect to get the results that you're looking for. And so I think it's, again, that pendulum shift. We, 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 we struggle with duality. We struggle with the ability to hold two ideas as, hey, these are both really good. You need them both. Um, so we're like, tell me the one thing you need to focus on your diet. Okay, sweet. And then every coach is like, well, shit, they don't want personal trainers anymore because everyone's telling them they're like, yeah, showing up to the gym is not that hard, but I need like, I need help with my food. And it's like, all right, well then I'll be a nutrition coach. All of a sudden you have a surge in dietitians, right? People going back to school to get, you know, nutrition knowledge to go back and provide to people who are now asking for it. So this one's interesting because I feel like I might push back on this one a little bit, but I might also push back in a way that's more so reframing it versus disagreeing with it. Um, so my way of reframing it would be that I don't think it's really too controversial to say that diet and nutrition has a greater magnitude of impact than training does. If you overeat, you will get fat. If you undereat, you will lose weight. If you overtrain a little bit or if you overtrain or if you undertrain, like that doesn't necessarily mean that everything else is going to go to shit, right? Mm -hmm. But if your training is perfect and your, your nutrition is a little bit off, you're going to feel that impact and vice versa. It's definitely not nearly as, as correlated in my mind, or it's not as absolute, right? Like most people don't train nearly as well as they could, or as optimally as they could, and they still make good progress, right? But if your diet is fucked the way that we see some people's training be fucked it's you you're you're in a really bad place right right yep and i think that it's often a lot easier to make dietary changes in terms of like like actual how much effort do i have to put into eating a little bit less food or eating a little bit more food versus how much more effort do i have to put into training a little bit harder mm -hmm. or doing more sets and doing it for longer periods of time. It's like, it might feel difficult to eat 500 less calories per day, but it's really easy to measure that, you know? Right. Um, and you typically get a lot more instant gratification and feedback from something like that too, right? Like you see the scale going down, you feel yourself tightening up, you maybe have a little bit more energy. Training it's harder to measure in terms of like what's good training and what's bad training. And typically you're not seeing the payoff for quite a while, unless you're someone who was like really untrained, you know? Right. And also it's really challenging to measure the difference between good training and bad training for someone who isn't an expert in these things and exercise science. And like, they, they don't really know the difference. Right. Like I could put a really bad training program in front of you and you're like, that's a bad training program. But I could put the same bad training program in front of someone who is a regular gym goer and they're like, this looks fine to me, you know? And they do those really bad training programs. They don't bat an eye. And I think that it's much easier to see a bad nutrition protocol and call it out for what it is these days, right? Like a lot, I think a lot more people are becoming just very aware of what nutrition is meant to be, even whenever you're like actually tracking your macros and you're relatively rigid with your nutrition, most people understand like, okay, these are kind of the principles behind nutrition. If you adhere to these, you're going to make some really good progress. The principles behind training are just very complex. Training is complex in general. There are a lot of variables that go in, into training. And I think that that becomes very overwhelming very quickly for clients, but also for coaches, right? So it's very much an out of sight, out of mind type of thing where they're like, it's good enough. I'm close enough. I'm training hard. I'm training hard. I feel like I'm sweating. I'm, I'm working hard. I'm sore. So like, that's good enough. That's good enough for me. 
And for coaches, that's often good enough for coaches whenever they're talking to their clients, right? Because to actually expend the effort to be a good coach on the training side of things is so much more challenging than it is to be a good nutrition coach. I, I, that might be a controversial belief anyway, but fuck, like, I don't give a shit really, obviously. Um, but just the sheer magnitude of like data that you have to work with and take into account whenever you are looking at training programs is exponentially greater than nutrition. We are underpaid. Huh? We are underpaid. Underpaid. Yeah. For, well, obviously, yes, of course, we're always underpaid. But, um, but I, I would say, I, I think that reframing it like that is a little bit better uh, because I would say that, again, I think that nutrition and diet obviously have a greater impact. They, they do, especially if you're, like you said, working in the extreme. So whether someone is like really untrained or really overweight, a nutrition change is going to have a huge impact. And then on the other extreme, people that are competing at the highest levels, right? Nutrition changes are going to have gigantic impacts, good and bad, right? If you yep. really nail it, that's the difference between you winning your show and you being in last call outs, right? If you fuck it up, that's also the difference, right? Like in, yep. in those, those changes can be like small degrees, very small degrees with training. Again, it's like, if you were a professional bodybuilder, the difference between taking every set to failure or leaving one rep in the tank on every set of every exercise, like it might make a difference, but you're not going to be able to measure that difference, right? You won't be able to. So there's no like counterfactual you can run to say, well, if I would have done this, I know that I would have gotten to this point, right? Like you can't yep. do that in your head. So again, it's very challenging to say, um, you know, what is better or optimal or what would have potentially been better in certain, cer certain situations or certain circumstances. Um, and, you know, again, on the other end of that extreme, so not pro bodybuilder, but someone who's very detrained, they might make a change to their, their cardio, let's say someone who's like very overweight, very detrained, they might make a change to their cardio. And again, like they're doing work, they're doing something. So it doesn't really matter, even if they make a relatively large change, right? It doesn't really matter because they just need to do something. So I would say that where you find the biggest impact is people that know generally what they should be doing, but don't have things absolutely dialed in, right? So like that middle of the bell curve. So like working within kind of like one standard deviation of the average, like people that are going to the gym already, they're already training relatively hard. They are already eating pretty well. They have a good grasp of, of everything that they're doing, but they just don't really care or pay as much attention to the specifics. Right. That's where you find a much more clear impact of really good training versus really bad training, right? Um, people that are eating enough protein, people that are generally eating around their maintenance, or maybe they go up to try and gain, maybe they go down a little bit at times to try and go into a deficit and like lose some body fat. But people that have a good grasp of what they're doing, they're consistent with it, right? I think that's an important aspect, consistency over the long term. Because if you are 1% off with your training, but you consistently are off for, by 1% for a long period of time, all of a sudden after a year, after two, after five years, you're fucked right. like way off course, right? And the same can be said about nutrition, but you know, just in general, I think that you get the feedback from nutrition much quicker, right? So if you're 1% off of nutrition, well, after a month, you're like, oh, fuck, I've, I've gained a few pounds. Well, let me correct right. now. There's no... There's no course correction that comes from training because you typically don't get the the feedback as immediately right. as you need it. Um, so I would say, I, again, I, I think now I'm talking myself into agreeing with you, but I think it's just like the way of of framing it that becomes crucially important. And obviously, we're super biased. Yeah. Well, obviously, very biased, but also right. Um, no, I mean, I think that the you hit a point there at the end where you talked about the feedback and which piggybacks off the idea that if you are a coach who specializes in training, the complexity of that job is likely higher than a coach who specializes in nutrition. We've talked about it. Like, Hey, listen, like really like good. Well, I will say this. We know some really good nutrition diet prep coaches and they don't just focus on four numbers and they don't just watch your, your macros and your weight come in and then tell you to adjust or tell you to say the same. 
Um, but a lot of them do. A lot of them do. A lot of them slap you with a meal plan with no macros at all and tell you to follow it. And then when you leave them, you have no idea what is going on or what you've been eating. You know, how many times have you asked the client, like, hey, like, what's your, what are your intakes? And they go, I'm like 1600 calories. And I'm like, what are your intakes? Well, I don't really know. Like, it's just, my, it's my, I'm like, fuck. I'm like, okay. That, that's just seems like not a way to educate someone. Um, definitely not in this space. I think, um, I, I agree with your reframing objectively because like, we, we understand the, uh, the, the science behind it. Obviously, I do understand the, the uptick to be had when implementing nutrition correctly versus implementing training correctly, correctly being most optimal for that person. I think I frame it the way I frame our, uh, our, our super strong promotion of the eccentric being so important, right? Like, you know, it's not that, I mean, there's a case that can be made for the eccentric being one of the most important pieces of a movement pattern, but there's also cases for, depending on movement pattern, like, hey, actually, like, and the athlete, what they're training for, the concentric being, hey, just as important, if not sometimes more uh, worth the focus. I guess I'm framing my that in capital letters with quotations as a, in relative reference to where society is. Okay. Because that, because of the focus and kind of the uh, the afterthought that uh, training has been demoted to, you know, it's like, okay, damn, if you guys had taken on this nutrition overhaul and retained what we were doing, America would be in a great place, right? As far as like knowledge and what the, the average person knows. Um, but again, I don't, I don't think that we can focus on more than one thing at once. And so when they're like, hey, listen, you know, this is not as important. You need to do this, you know, right? And people are like, okay, sweet. So they, they stop focusing on good programs and watching good training videos and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, I know what I'm doing. You know, how many times you get a client and they go, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good, right? And I'm just like, oh, my God, you just cursed it. You just jinxed it because your shit's going to be trash. I think it's going to be. They put that they're advanced on their, oh, their applications. Yeah. Like I've been training for ten plus years. I'm like, eh, so novice. <laughs> like you know, like yeah. yeah, like we'll 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 see how you show up here. You know, um, you know, and, and it's a cool part for us because we'd be almost always get that wow factor. Like I might have like two clients, three clients who like just go great programming, love this, right? But almost every one week, one goes, wow, this is cool. Like thank you, this is so much. This is this is. I thought I was training. I haven't been. I'm like yeah, I know. Um. And I think that is where I'm coming from with my controversial take, as in, like, obviously, subjectively, I believe that uh, we as a society don't focus on training enough, right? Not for the goals we have, you know? Oh, I want a fat ass. I go to the gym and I do body weight squats and this and that and this and that and then this. And that. But here's my diet because I'm going to grow my ass with this chicken magically. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> like, but you're not, you know? So, um, I, I think that that is where I'm coming from. No, I, I agree with you. And uh, I think that I would, um, I would kind of go back to, uh, the fact that nutrition is nutrition and diet are just in general, so much more measurable, right? Um, there are formulas that you can put your body weight and your goals into, and it will spit back macros, micros, hydration, supplement that you should probably take just to like optimize certain things, right? Or optimize whatever. But I mean, you can go based off of something like that and get in the ballpark, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's not perfect, but you can get in that range. And the reason for that is because we understand minimums. Mm -hmm. We understand maximums for a ton of nutritional values, right? Protein. We understand about how much protein you should be eating and about how much protein you should not be eating for various goals, right? Or for various types of people. Carbs, we understand this. Fats, we have ranges. We have ranges for every fucking micronutrient, every vitamin, every mineral. We understand all of these things because tons of scientific data and studies are out there to validate these things because food is a really important industry. It's always been very important, right? Like, these things have to be standardized. You have food labels, nutrition labels for a reason. There are percentages next to everything on there. There's a reason for that, right? If you just extrapolate that out and say, okay, cool. This is telling me that, you know, 
protein it that you know 50 grams of protein in this meal is about you know 25 percent of my i'm just bullshitting right now but about five five percent of my daily intake or my goal intake okay well if i multiply 50 times four then that's 200 okay well i'm about there like i know about where i should be obviously nutrition labels are not individualized they're they're based off of like rdas they're based off of averages they're based off of what's going to keep you healthy but you at least know values right yeah. you can't do the same fucking thing for training right there like there's no website you can go into and be like okay cool like i'm this person here are my goals and it's not going to spit out a reasonably consistent training program split exercise selection volume none of that shit right because there's too many variables you can start super zoomed out and you can zoom all the way in okay like we're going macro cycle we're going mesocycle we're going micro cycle training week what's your split Okay, well, what's the order that you're going in? What are the exercises that you're doing? How many sets? How many reps? What are the rep ranges? What are the intensities? What tempo are you using? What rest periods are you using? Like all of these things, that is really granular. That's super yeah. granular. There's nothing that you can do in some kind of online calculator to give you a semi-reasonable estimate of what would be good for you, right? Nothing, nothing. Granted, you can be like, okay, cool. Like here's a general program for someone who wants to train four days a week and wants to grow their their lower body but, but even that's tough right like there's there's very no, like, tough. very to tough. your point there's no like relative meet the mean right like obviously whenever you get to like athletes like people who specialize in the sport or are fitness enthusiasts that have been doing it a while at a high level relatively yeah. high level um things can obviously they can they can do a more meet the mean right they can just go look for programs because they have the knowledge to augment adjust but you talk about the millions of people who do not have that right the majority the 90 percent yeah there's no there's not a meet the mean calculator there's not a meet the mean resource for that 90 percent to go to and have it meet them where they're at and do a pretty good job like an above average job and put them in the realm that they should be in right either it's like very very trivial and it's on way under what they need to be doing or it is you know way too advanced and probably starting them you know off a bit uh, further than they should be starting. And so, um, yeah, I think it's a really good way to frame it. Sorry, I didn't cut you off there. No, no, you're good. And like, I, I don't, I don't mean to, um, devalue nutrition coaching because nutrition coaching, um, dietitians, prep coaching, like, especially like any kind of like high level competition sport, anything like that, right? Good coaches are invaluable. They yeah. are right. Yep. But there is a gigantic, gigantic gap between the good coaches and pretty much everyone else, right? And the reason for that is because, kind of like going back to what I just said, the presence of ranges for almost everything, the presence of online calculators, apps for everything nutrition related has simplified the job of being a nutrition coach yeah. to the point of, I hate to be an asshole here but I'm going to, anyone can walk in off the street, anyone can walk in off the street and take a call with a potential client who wants help with their nutrition. If they get a few values from that person, their age, their weight, their goals, any kind of nutrition limitations that they might have, they can literally take that information, put that in an online calculator, and then present that to the client and say, cool, here's your protocols. Give me $500. Right. And you know what? They do it. Yep. Lots of coaches do that. It happens often. It happens all the fucking time, all the time. And I hate to burst that bubble, but there are a lot of coaches that don't know what the fuck they're doing. Whenever it comes to nutrition, all they do is they go to an online calculator. They put these numbers in. It spits out some generalized formula, some generalized values. They send that to their clients and then they hope for the best. Yep. That's literally what they do. And that's what the majority of coaches do. And the reason why they do that is because it's good enough. Like it truly yep. is good enough for the majority. If people, they right? follow it, it'll, it'll work at least. And, yes. And, and the thing is, if they follow it, it will work because any, I hate to say any good coach, but any like reasonably minded human being would understand if they're communicating with their clients who are now paying them lots of money. And those clients are saying, well, you know, this isn't really working or my weight isn't really going down. That coach would be like, well, let's eat a little bit less. Right. 
And then eventually it will work. That's the fucked up thing, right? Like if you tell your clients to just eat less and eat less and eat less and do more and do more and do more cardio, eventually that scale weight will go down. <laughs> like that's the fucked up thing. You, you keep pressing the button. You will start to get some feedback at some point. Um, but most coaches, especially whenever it comes to nutrition, like they're not weighing the repercussions of pressing that button an infinite amount of times on their client. Again, kind of like what we were talking about last time. They care about being paid. Yep. They they don't really give a shit about what happens to their client in the interim. They're like, well, you're getting results. Look, the scale weight's going down. You feel lighter. Mm -hmm. Your clothes are fitting you better. Awesome. That means we're getting results. Well, sure, I guess. But at what cost, right? At what cost? And then, like, again, they're not doing anything. All they're doing is they're putting some values in. There's no knowledge required there. Going back to what I said a second ago, caveat, really good coaches, really, really qualified, intelligent dietitians, they are worth the money because they actually know how to handle problems on an individual level. Yep. There are a lot, a lot of quote unquote coaches who, let's just say, for example, have a large following on social, on a social media mm -hmm. platform because they have a really nice body or they look fit. And a lot of people start reaching out to them, asking them for advice because they look like they should have that advice, right? Yep. They do not have that knowledge or that experience because they have genetics that not everyone else has, right? For me, I'm naturally fucking skinny. I did not know how to get people skinny before I went, I went to school for it and before I did all of these other things to make myself qualified to help people get skinny. I was just a, a natural skinny kid. Like I didn't know what I was doing, right? I wasn't intentionally counting my calories or my macros to be skinny. I was just fucking skinny. So there are a lot of people that are in that same boat. They naturally just look good or they're naturally jacked or they naturally have six packs or they naturally have a fat ass, whatever it is, right? They don't know how to help other people get to that point. So whenever they start getting asked all of these questions, well, they're not going to say no to money. Right. So then they need something to bridge that gap in knowledge. Well, lucky for them, there's a million and one online fucking calculators for nutrition there's a million apps that they can go to and basically offload the knowledge components of coaching to these things while they collect that premium, yep. right? That's how so many of these businesses continue to churn is because there is a gigantic gap in knowledge from the client versus knowledge of what's actually happening by the coach, right? The client yep. thinks that they're paying for the coach's expertise when in reality, that coach doesn't have expertise. They're outsourcing that to something else or someone else. Right. But they're getting paid for the assumption that they are more knowledgeable because of their physique, because of their, their social status, right? Long tangent, but I do think it's really important a lot of people, that a lot of people understand that because, I mean, it's easy to like internalize. Well, you know, they look a certain way, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they know what they're talking about. But it's hard to isolate that because a lot of those people, like they present themselves as knowing what they're talking about, right? Like, I mean, yeah. you pump out regurgitated content forever by just going on social media and finding other people's content and basically just repackaging that, going to chat GPT, be like, hey, reword this, right? Pump out your own content, right? Like, you don't have to know anything. You don't know how to know how to apply knowledge. And I think that's the thing. Well, yeah, I no, no, I'm, I'm basically done. I need to stop. <laughs> No, oh, um, no, I, I think that that is, as you were talking, I was thinking about it and I think it's interesting for these, a lot of coaches out there, right? Coaches in, in quotations with a lowercase C, um, they, their job can be relegated to a single equation and not even a complex one, just, uh, you know, calories in calories out. And they just continue, like you said, to push that button. Um, and for people on weight loss journeys, people who are like very, very overweight, maybe that's a good place to start, right? Just due to not wanting to overcomplicate things, right? Yes. So that's that's the thing is that for a lot of people it works. And so when you when you sit there and you reduce like, hey, your job is like, hey, this is what they eat, this is what they should stop eating, so this, this is what, you know, whatever, right? Like it is literally a subtraction equation that their job is. And then motivating someone to keep putting numbers into that equation, right? Um, I think that that's it's, it's a it's a pretty interesting 
thought. Um, I think really good coaches. I think that it should be said because we do know several. Um, really good coaches take that equation and delineate it into context and they, they break it down, right? For those who need it, right? Especially for like prep athletes and stuff like that, right? Because we also know and have seen prep coaches treat prep athletes the way they would treat gen pop and just keep pressing that button, right? If I just you with enough drugs and keep taking enough food away from you, I will get you lean for the stage, right? And then, you know, especially young women, they're they're fucked for the next however many months, years, whatever. They lose their periods. Um, their hormones are all off. Their mentals are all off. And But the coach doesn't care because like we said before, the coaches care about getting paid and they care about making sure that you look a certain part when you step on stage with their name, you know, as, as the team that you're on. I will add to that. This might even be another controversial opinion, but I think that prep coaching is in a lot of ways easier than gym pop coaching. And the reason for that is because a lot of times the most challenging aspect of being a coach is ensuring that your clients are adherent mm -hmm. and consistent. Gym pop is very challenging because the psychological component of getting them to the gym getting them to go from zero to one, right? Like right. they're inactive. They're not paying attention to their diet. They are unhealthy. How do we get them to be healthy? Or if, how do we build habits? That's yeah. fucking hard, right? Like that is really hard. You know, it's really easy working with people that are robots that will do anything that you say, because then if you want to get someone really lean, all you have to do is keep pressing that fucking button until it works it. or keep pressing the drug button. Right. Or, or both at the same time, slam <laughs> and not knowing what's working. And that's the thing is like so many coaches slam so many buttons that a it's bound to work. Mm -hmm. B they don't know what's actually working. Right. Like that's the thing, right? If you decrease someone's nutritional intake so much, you increase their output so much and you increase their drugs so much, they will get lean mm -hmm. at some point and they will look quote unquote stage ready, right? Right. They will be at that level of leanness and conditioning. But <laughs> like that is literally the easiest thing in the world. I could train a monkey to do that, right? Okay, cool. Monkey, you each week, more cardio, less food, more drugs. Great. Yep. That is so fucking easy. That is so easy. And if something's not working, guess what? You press the button harder. How, how difficult is that? Because your clients will continue to do it like, like mindless zombies. They will continue mm -hmm. to do it because once they have that trust, because they're paying for trust, they're paying because I want this person to be giving me the correct advice. I'm trusting that this person is going to be giving me, giving me the correct advice because of X, Y, Z, right? X, Y, Z. And a lot of times they do have some kind of, the coaches will have some kind of like, um, some kind of status or some kind of, of reputation or whatever else it might, yeah, whatever else it might be. And again, whether that's good or bad, it's not the full story, right? Because again, having and working with people that will always do exactly what you tell them to do, whether it's good or bad is, I mean, it's not challenging. That's really not hard. Like if you're working with gen pop, clients and they're the types of people that like have no idea how to even get started mm -hmm. like that is that is actually hard right like that's really really hard you take someone from overweight to fit bro you are fuck you you must be at least somewhat of a good coach right because there's so many things that go into that outside of just the formula that oftentimes like you're having to basically act as a therapist act as a coach act as their, their personal trainer, act as, you know, <laughs> their fucking guidance counselor, like all of the things, you know, like half the time you're, you're their spouse too. Like you're like a, like a surrogate spouse for them. And it's, it's challenging, right? It's really challenging. But whenever you're working with like really high level athletes, the expectation is they're just going to shut up and do it. Yep. And, and they, you, they usually don't even ask questions, right? Like, that's the thing. Like, how that's many, the bad part. That's, that's, that's like, how many stuff. clients do we even have? Like, I'm like, I wish that you would just ask me questions because I feel like I could tell you to do anything and you would do it, which like, I guess as a coach, again, that's, that makes my job easier. Yeah. 
But like, I don't, I don't want that instilled as a culture in our business or in our clients, right? Like I want everyone to be comfortable just being like, why the fuck am I doing this? Especially right. stuff that's new, right? Like we give someone something new. They're like, I've never seen this before. Why am I doing it? What is this? Right. Yep, yep. But again, it's just like, I, I feel like the, as a client or for most clients, it's an expectation of like, just shut up and do it. Yep. Just, just, you know, don't be a difficult client. And I, I get that because I mean, as a, me being a client before and also me as a coach, like, uh, trust me, like, you know, don't make my life harder, but at the same time, it does open the door for so many of these like really bad practices to happen. Yeah. I mean, there's a difference between asking questions and questioning, right? Mm -hmm. Questioning lends itself to like interrogating that like forceful, almost undermining tone, like why the fuck? And it's like, I mean, dude, if you don't trust me as your coach, because that's where that tone is coming from, then Are you, you need to, yeah, exactly, like you'd go somewhere else. Um, but asking questions, please, like, yeah, yeah, I, I have clients and they can be annoying sometimes with all the questions they have, but I enjoy that they ask them because I'd rather you ask and believe in what you're doing than to mindlessly do it, half-ass it, and then maybe someone else asks you about it and then you can't answer because they don't know and you don't know. And now it's like, this guy's on the fuck he's talking about. He's just doing stuff. And it's like, all you had to do was ask a question if you didn't understand. And I, we, we encourage that. And I think that there is a level of prestige in the way that nutrition especially is pitched as so complex, which I think I get, I get why, right? Because if you understand the, the realm that nutrition coaches, prep coaches, dietitians, nutritionists, whatever, whoever's there, right? Whatever, whatever blank coach they're, they're calling themselves, they have to find a way to differentiate themselves. And the only way to do that in the realm of nutrition is to almost like kind of pull the veil back on the complexities of it. Like, hey, like, don't just pay anybody, pay me because I understand these things, these things that you don't know, these things that you can't, that you, cool. And the same though, it's like, you almost create this like disparity, this, this growing gap where it's like, okay, well now it's so complex that I just don't ask. I'm just here to follow. You're, you're like, it's like a doctor, right? When your doctor says, Hey, you take this medication, you don't ask him why you should take this one and not the generic. You know, you go, Hey, that's what you told me to take, bro. I don't know. I'll fuck it. Right. I'm gonna do what he said. I'm not going to push back and ask that question. Like, is this going to react to my body a certain way? Will this one react differently? Um, you know, you go to get your car fixed, right. You know, there's a level of complexity underneath the hood that intimidates a lot of us. And I think we have that same kind of intimidation as a, as a society about what happens inside of our body. So instead of asking questions, we just pay an expert and they tell us what to do. And we don't ask questions. We just foot the bill like we would to go get our car. And, you know, we, we drive it away and hope that it works. The assumption is that if you're paying an expert, that they will always give you good advice or the best advice, right? And obviously that's not true. Like yeah. how many times have you gone to a mechanic to get your car fixed and two days later, the fucking same check engine light is on. Yeah. Right. Or how many times have you gone to, let's say, uh, a doctor, right? Or maybe this one is, is not that common, but like people go to doctors all the fucking time mm -hmm. and the doctor will give them advice that is either less than optimal or it's contradictory to something that another doctor would tell them or they have forgotten something about a previous visit or a conversation that they had in the past or you know xyz or another thing that you all, always have to take into account is like are they pushing something on you right I, that's a that's a shitty thing to have to think about like is this is my doctor pushing a drug on me to solve a problem that is either not that big of an issue or could be solved through other measures or, you know, X, Y, like, are they, are they in some way getting some kind of like kickback from this? Like, is there, is there a practices are? Yeah. Yeah. Is there a partnership that, that I'm not seeing that might be like operating in the background? Like, again, I, I, I like thinking about everything in terms of like incentives. Right. But like every time you go to an expert, I think the assumption has to be that experts 
also make mistakes. And just because someone is a professional does not make them an expert, right? right? People can get qualified or certified or fuck, most of the time you don't even need to be qualified or certified for a lot of these jobs, right? But you can do those things without really knowing how to apply that knowledge in the real world, yeah. right? Like you can be a doctor who got through med school, but is not that great at actually being a fucking doctor to a lot of people, you know, granted having to work at like do, through residencies and stuff like that, like mm-hmm. that definitely bridges that gap. But I mean, you could take a test and not really know what the fuck you're doing whenever it's mm-hmm. like putting that in practice, you know? Yeah. And I think, I don't know. I actually had a, a talk with one of our professors. Um, for those who don't know, my my major was heavily mixed with nutrition and community health um, and exercise science. So not just solely, you know, um, exercise science. So I'm a little bit more well-rounded than Bryce, but we knew that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the the professor is pretty much like, hey, listen, like this is one of the only courses that kids on the med track have to take in nutrition um, that, you know, doctors are just, they're really not educated in diet and diet practice and how to educate, you know, a patient coming in to see them and say, Hey, you know, like uh, you get generic answers from a lot of docs, eat less, this, your BMI is this, da, da, da. And it's very, very generic. It's cut and dry. It's based on the, the very base level science when as a doctor, you know, you have one patient right now, bro. Your job is actually to take and construe and and modify and morph everything to this person right now and their experience. You're not coaching a bunch of people. You're not helping a bunch of people. You are talking to one person right now. And so to say something as arbitrary as you need to eat less, you need to eat more without saying, oh, well, wait, hold on. I should understand what you're eating, how you're eating, what other complexities you have in your life. Uh, but they're just not taught so not educated they're not encouraged to to be educated in that way they have to learn a lot i I know i've worked with doctors i've worked with surgeons really really smart people that didn't know diddly shit about what you should put in your body aside from the drugs that they could prescribe you great guys great women didn't know shit about hey i just die at them asking me questions about that shit i'm standing in the corner of the room in my scrubs and they only ask me that because like well you're jacked and we know you competed before so like I'm working, I'm doing keto now, man. What do you think? You know, and she's like that. I'm just like, bro, you have a white coat on with letters behind your name. Why are you asking me this question? These are answers that you should have. I get it. My specialty is something I'm very, very heavily versed in. That's what my whole job was based on. I'm helping them in surgery with something that is my job, right? Not the entirety of the surgery, but just my product, how to implant it, how to reduce, you know, the fractures and stuff like that. But they trust me because of my specificity there. They have to know so much. So I understand that like, they can't zero in on nutrition, but they should know more before they can put a white coat on and claim to be the smartest person in the room, right? If they're going to give someone advice, it's the same thing that happens in the coaching industry, right? Someone goes and opens a book, reads it for a couple of months, and they sit down for a CPT test or nutritionist test online, and they get a certification. Now they can put letters behind their name and demand a level of prestige or differentiation from other coaches because like, well, I, I know this, right? Here's proof that I know this. So you know, you read a book. You read a book. That, that's that, that's all that's proof of is you read a book and you memorized it. Like there's there's nothing else from that. Most people don't either. Like again, think about this, right? Like for most of these certifications, you have to pay hundreds of dollars to even sit for them, right? So the certifications themselves, the oversight committees of the certifications, they want people to sit down and take those exams because they get paid for them, right? Like, okay, that obviously incentivizes them to make the exams, I hate to say it, but as easy as possible, because if it's an extraordinarily hard exam and it also costs a lot of money, unless there is some kind of like additional benefit attached to it, right? Like I would say like the CSES is something that has additional benefit attached to it because if you are wanting to work in a a collegiate or professional athletic setting, you have to have a CSES, right? right? It's mandatory. But if you're sitting down, take like some kind of CPT exam and there's another exam or cert out there that other people know is, is cheaper and has a guaranteed higher or a higher guaranteed success rate or something like that, then why the fuck would they take your exam, right? So there's right. an intent to make it easier and make it less expansive and allow more people to pass it, right? But 
If you're a client, you don't know that. You see letters behind someone's name or you see some shit like in their Instagram bio that they have this or that certification. You don't know what the qualifications for that cert are. Right. You don't know if it required them to have you know, a PhD in exercise science or if it required them to, you know, Google the fucking answers online while they took mm -hmm. a 30 minute, 30 minute exam. You know what I mean, like it, most exams are super fucking easy, right? Like if people can't pass a lot of these certification exams then they're honestly pretty stupid. So like, I, I hate to say it like that, but like truly they should not be coaching if they can't pass the majority of like these really, really simple exams. And if it takes them multiple times to pass it, they definitely need to move on to a different profession. Sorry to say it like that, but, um, all right. I think maybe we should move on. <laughs> oh yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. Oh God, it's my turn. Yeah. No, that was, I, I was, that was good, bro. I like it. I guess I had some time today, so I'm glad we got to take it. It's definitely your turn. I'm curious to know, you know, what you, uh, you've come up with last, uh, last week's was, was solid. Um, definitely stirred some conversation. So, uh, let's, let's all hear right. it. I do. I have a good amount that I wrote down. Um, I'm trying to figure out which one would be the best. Um, so I think, so this is one of them that I have, and I, I don't think that I want to expand on it because hmm. we kind of just talked about it. But one of them was uh, essentially, I think that in the coming decades, maybe one, two decades, that a lot of coaches will be in prison. A lot of coaches from the past, let's say, 10 years will be in prison. And when I, was, when I say, off, uh, when I, excuse me, whenever I say coaches, I mean online coaches mm -hmm. because it's unregulated. Yep. And I think that there will be a lot of, a lot of lawsuits that come out from coaches severely ruining people's health or killing people. And I... I will go out on a limb and say that I think that a lot of coaches will end up in prison in the next coming decades, but I don't want to go into that one because that's kind of a little bit too related. Um, all right. So this one is actually probably pretty good. Uh, I think that most things holistic are bullshit. So anytime I see holistic, I, my brain automatically goes to, this is probably bullshit. This is probably like snake oil. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the reason for that is is kind of what we alluded to last time with like empowerment coaching and life coaching and relationship coaching and all of these things is um, the the further that you get away from being able to quantitatively measure something and the further out you get into qualitative, the easier it is to bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, and then the more that it turns into a marketing and sales game unless that it turns into a results game or product or service right so i think that the idea behind again so it's a movement right the idea behind holistic is good very good yeah. I, I agree with the idea behind holistic however i think that holistic or a a push towards trying to solve every problem through natural means is extremely bad advice and can harm or kill people straight up. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, so if you're, if you're a holistic coach and let's say that you are reading someone's blood values and they have, let's say that they have like a RBC, like red blood cell count mm -hmm. that is, is really high. And you're like, oh my God, let's just, you know, let's take more of this, like this root, this root that I know, you know, it, 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 it will reduce your, your, your blood values, right? It will, it will normalize your RBCs. So let's go ahead and add this root into your supplement protocol. That's probably already fucking 10 pages long. Right. Well, if that person fucking has a stroke or has a, a blood clot and dies when they could have literally just taken like some kind of like pharmaceutical drug. That is designed for that and solve that problem. That is incredibly negligent yep. for any kind of holistic coach, right? And again, I want to I want to be careful with my words because I think that the first line of defense in any kind of of problem solving should be natural, quote unquote right. natural. 
right? Like it, it, you should be able to at least rule out low hanging fruit solutions before you move on to any kind of pharmaceutical intervention. But oftentimes the best solution is pharmaceutical, right? And people that have such a, such an aversion to anything pharmaceutical are honestly stupid, stupid. stupid. Say it. Like, so there, it's, it's being like willfully blind yeah. and ignorant and conspiratorial in a lot of, a lot of ways. I am not in any way going to say that pharmaceutical drugs are perfect. No fucking way. Most of them have side effects that are pretty severe. And if you don't understand the side effects, you can be in a lot of trouble. If you add a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical drug into your, your protocols without understanding all the risks or potential, you know, negative externalities that might, might come with it. But, and I, I think that part of what I wanted to go off of was, um, I see a lot of people that basically root for new drugs to fail, mm. right? It's because they, they don't trust like pharmaceutical companies, which mm. You shouldn't trust, you shouldn't trust anyone. You shouldn't trust pharmaceutical companies. You shouldn't trust politicians. You shouldn't trust us, right? You should verify, you should do your research, right? Um, but like with GLP-1 agonists, right? So like semaglutide, things like that. Like I, I see people rooting so hard for these drugs to fail because of, oh my God, well, look, it gives people tummy aches. Like their stomachs are hurting. Oh no, like they get nausea, like obviously this wasn't like a cure-all drug. Like we should definitely like ban it or, oh my God, like people that take semaglutide, they, they lose muscle. It's a fucking weight loss drug. You dumbass. No shit. They lose muscle. It's not, it's not steroids. You fucking, right. ugh, people are so stupid. So like, but the thing for me though, is I'm like, a lot of people root for those drugs to fail. They're like actively championing, championing against these drugs potentially working, which anyone who does not know what like semaglutide or GLP-1 agonists are, these are drugs that in research and trials have shown really, really, really impressive benefits for weight loss, for normalization of body weight, right? Like things that previously have been only achievable through like surgical interventions. So these are very promising drugs. Like right. if, if you Google it, <laughs> Walmart like large grocery chains are literally losing money because people are buying less food. Like Walmart stock is down because people are buying less food because more people are taking semaglutide and GLP-1 agonists. Yeah. That's insanity to think about. That's fucking dope. That's yeah, crazy. kind of cool. That's crazy. That's crazy to think about, right? But like that's the potential for something like this. So if it works on a large scale, even with some side effects, yeah. because side effects are always about weighing the pros against the side effects, right? Like nothing is a free lunch, obviously. But if this thing works at scale, then it literally changes the lives of millions of people in the world, right? It, again, it's not perfect. It doesn't come without its downsides. It's, it's expensive right now. It's a shot right now. Like there's a, a, essentially a monopoly on, on the creation of, of the drug, right? Right. But all drugs over time, they, they get democratized, they come down in price. Like that's what we want, right? Like we want these things to become cheaper for everyone. And you can say the same thing about pretty much anything else that you want to think about, right? So let's say like blood cholesterol. Sure. There are a lot of ways that you can normalize and regulate your blood cholesterol through holistic measures, through diet, through exercise, through stress management. Yes, of course. But some people have genetically high blood cholesterol, they will need to go on some kind of pharmaceutical intervention. And if they don't, they will shorten their life. Right. You could say the same thing about a lot of different things, right? Lots of different things. Not everything is solvable through holistic measures. And the active push to make everything holisticified is really, in my opinion, harmful, right? Like we should, we should do a much better job of being skeptical about pharmaceutical drugs for sure, right? Definitely because there's 
profit to be made there. But at the same time, understanding that sometimes pharmaceutical interventions are absolutely a better idea than holistic. And most of the time, holistic measures are not going to have the effect size to actually make any kind of significant difference in that person's health. No, yeah, I've been sitting here this whole time trying. Well, first, I sat here for a while and thought about those old commercials um, that would come on late night TV that were like, hey, if you uh, had negative side effects from a vaginal mesh implantation, it was like, <laughs> like, like, like 10, 20 years, it'll be like some yeah. ad in the meta space about like, have been negatively affected by an online coach? Have you seen like, and it'll just like, rattle off all the fucking side effects and these people will go to jail. Um, but then I was also trying to disagree with the, the actual point you brought, um, which I'm, I was struggling with. And so eventually I just like let myself do what my brain was going to do. And I mean, I think it comes back to the same thing, right? The body positivity movement, even what we were just talking about in the way of like finding good coaches, being a good coach, asking questions. It's the fact that we tend to avoid um, at mass taking responsibility or ownership of any part of our process we want to just pay for it to go away yeah i'll pay you you take care of it sheer laziness so instead of people coming through hey this pharmaceutical drug might be good for me this holistic measure might be good for me or maybe this holistic measure in combination with this pharmaceutical drug in some sort of you know tandem for a time being might be good I, the more i kept thinking about it, my mom has a holistic doc that she goes to um, sweet lady, awesome, super fucking smart, really fucking smart. She's from Africa, like super fucking smart. My mom's always coming back with like, well, yeah, she made this, done did this root, this, 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 that. And my mom is by no means like grossly obese, but she's definitely overweight. My mom's like six one, two twenty, and she had the stats of a middle linebacker in the NFL. Like she's 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 not a small lady, but it's all in the hips, so she carries it well. She's fifty, she looks great. Um, but. My, my thought process there as I'm thinking about it is by the time you go to the doctor, something's usually wrong. Holistic measures in my mind are habitual things that are more preemptive. Like these are things you maybe should be like incorporating daily to keep your cholesterol down. These are things you should incorporate daily to help regulate sleep. But if you come to the doc with insomnia, like I cannot go to sleep, bro. I haven't slept in the last fucking 12 days. You need something, bro. Give me a shot. Punch me in the face. Something needs to happen in the immediacy of things. And then we can talk about the holistic measures and habits that I should be implementing over time so that I don't need to be punched in the face when I come and see you. But when you're going to see a doc, when you're going to see a coach, when you're looking for someone, you're looking for help right now. You're looking to start to reverse current symptoms or conditions right now and holistic measures like you mentioned are just not going to have that um that ramped up exponential like onset of, of effects right to be able to help you and again there is the marketing play like you said you take the the quantitative and you move towards the qualitative of like hey look you're putting less chemicals in your body and, da -da 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 -da. and it's like well that's lazy because some of those things that are created are like good for you like they, they can help you they can help you live a better life and well the chemicals is such the it's the fucking laziest excuse for a negative ever if you think about it right like think about it for a second chemical sounds bad but everything is a fucking chemical yep. everything's a chemical right so if you don't define what a bad chemical is and you're just saying there are chemicals in it it sounds bad but they're not saying anything yeah. Everything is chemicals. Like, what fucking chemicals are bad? What are you talking about? Like, I would continue. No, no, that, that's actually really good. That's a really good point. Like, I, again, it's it's the jargon. It's the phrasing. It's the fear mongering around whatever, right? It's the body positivity movement coming in and going, we're encouraging people to change their bodies. No, we're giving people a tool to be healthy. And we're also, as autonomous human beings, allowed to make that decision ourselves. As a responsible consumer, I can decide I do not want that, but I should not be deciding it because you've terrified me by saying that, oh, because it's from this company, because Pfizer makes it, because this company makes it, they must be, it's a money grab. It's all the money grab. It's like, yeah, sure. There, there's definitely oh, there to be. 
Yeah, exactly. There's profit to be made. Like you can't sit there and take away the efficacy of something being done surely because it's profitable to the people doing it. Like, like, you, yes. like, like, yes. like the intentionality of something. Sure. You can, you can start marginalizing and contextualizing those things, right? Like how hard is a company pushing something? Who are they pushing it on? But that doesn't take away from the brass tacks of like, what is this product and can it help people? And if that is a yes, then they should have access to it. You should shut the fuck up. No, no. I 100% agree with, with what you just said, though. Like, profit, whenever we're talking about businesses, talking, we live in a, a capitalist country, which hate that as much as you want to. That's fine. That's the reality, right? And you can think whatever you want to about, like, the moral or or ethical implications behind capitalism behind profit generation whatever but just because a company that that sole purpose is to create profit i hate to say sole purpose but like as a as a moralist and as a i guess like non anthropomorphized entity a company's only goal is to generate profit right is to generate money there there's no there's no like moral or ethical goal, right? Like if you're a pharmaceutical company, your mission might be to, you know, eradicate cancer. To make money. But you know, like your mission statement, right? Like your mission statement yeah, might no, be no, eradicate it's cancer. The, it's in parentheses, the part that no one talks yeah. about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like that's your, your public facing statement, right? But like the reality, of, someone starts a business because there's money to be made, right? A hundred percent. Like no one is going to run a business, a private vent, a business, a private enterprise, if they're not going to make money, like th that's understand that. I want everyone to understand that and internalize that. Right. And everything has incentives behind it. Right. But you have to pay attention to what incentive is driving what. So like what you said, just because profit is being generated, doesn't make something inherently a negative or bad thing, but what incentives are driving that profit? What incentives are driving the marketing campaigns, the advertising campaigns, the demographic that they're targeting? Like what, what decisions are be ma being made behind the scenes right. that are influencing that, that profit generation, right? That's where we start to get into some like sticky situations. That's where people can be like, oh, capitalism is bad because like the whole idea behind capitalism is basically like fuel this profit generation to infinity. That's also whenever you see like these monopolistic companies especially pharmaceutical companies that retain patents like insulin and they charge you know, $500 for a bottle of insulin that makes that you know it, it takes them 30 cents to to create right? right like that's hugely problematic really problematic but the idea behind a lot of that stuff is okay well you democratize these things it spreads the profit out amongst a lot of companies a lot of competitors to eventually the profit margins are decreased to the point where no single company can overcharge to exorbitant degrees like that, right? right? If you look at a company like Walmart, I was actually telling Lexus the other day because I found it absolutely insane. A company like Walmart, or you know what their profit margins are? Take a guess. Uh, I would imagine not that high per like unit of item. Um, it's just obviously for because I think of like sheer competition and, and volume. For for every dollar, their profit margin is less than a cent, less than a yeah. penny. That is crazy small, razor thin margins, right? Mm -hmm. Razor thin. But the reason for that is because they have scaled the business, the corporation, to a degree of efficiency that they can do that because they make enough in revenue, enough in sales, that even less than 1% of profit margin means that they're making billions of dollars a year. Right. Which again, that's what we want. We we want that. And people can say, okay, well, you know, that drives out mom and pop businesses and stuff like that. Unfortunately, that's the reality. But that means that we get to pay less for mm -hmm. better quality goods. Pick what you want. Do you want to pay more money and have a less efficient economy? Or do you want to pay less and have, you know, scale economies right. of scale? Big businesses like Walmart and Kroger and Giant Eagle and all these things. All right, that's getting off on a tangent. Anyway, no, that was good. That was actually a good point. I just thought of something. Keep going. But 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 coming back to like the whole holistic and and all of that stuff, right? Okay, so I I firmly believe that 
whenever you're weighing all of the pros and cons of holistic versus pharmaceutical versus price versus guaranteed rate of success, all of these things, right? More often than not, especially like what you said, once you're presented with symptoms that are severe enough to where you're, you're paying attention now, mm -hmm. you're seeking help. It's often too late to think about any holistic measures. Right. You need to go for the pharmaceutical intervention at that point. Think about, and I've actually heard of this before, and this is fucking mind blowing to me that this is actually a thing, but I get it because people are predatory as fuck. Like what we've talked about people that have cancer and they go to someone who promotes holistic measures for cancer rather than chemotherapy. It, it's a thing. It's a thing. And it's fucking sad. That's super sad because they will convince cancer patients who obviously are desperate. Like they're, yeah. they're, they've just heard the worst news that you could ever hear. And they're, they're looking for answers. So they're impressionable, right? And a lot of people in that situation, whenever they hear bad news, would be very impressionable. And someone coming to them with the solution to all their problems that doesn't require millions of dollars of hospital bills and pain and, you know, all the psychological suffering that comes with going through like chemotherapy and all that stuff. And they're offering them a solution. They're saying like, you know, this holistic measure, I can do this for you. I, I it's, it's the secrets of the ancient East, right? Ancient Chinese knew what they were doing. They can solve cancer through acupuncture or whatever bullshit, right? Like, think about how dangerous and irresponsible that is. And it happens. It fucking happens, right? And granted, that's that's a large scale. Like, that is that is talking about holistic interventions on a grand scale whenever it becomes so problematic that you can't turn a blind eye to how problematic it is, right? Right. But you can still zoom in and say, okay, well, at what point do we say that a holistic intervention is better than a pharmaceutical intervention? Because... Oftentimes, the pharmaceutical interventions are interventions because they fucking work and they are almost guaranteed to work to some degree, right? Not without side effects, right. but would you rather something work and eradicate your problem and have potential side effects or not work and not have side effects? Like, what do you want? What the fuck do you want? So yeah, again, tangent, I know that you're up. It's your turn to say something, so I'll let you talk. No, nah, Rob, I was just listening. Like I said, I took time today. We're good. No, I um everything you just said, I think that it's it's huge. And I think that there needs to be a a framing. So if you've made it this far, um, I'm gonna do it for you. Um you mentioned mom and pop shops earlier, you know, and oh, we don't want big business because, you know, mom and pop, you know, they'll be put out of business or, you know, they'll have to drive their prices up even more because now they're making less money because they need to make more per unit or whatever, right? So it's like, sure, right? Um, one. When mom and pops are making billions of dollars, they're going to do the same thing Walmart did. So 100%. just understand that. <laughs> like, they're going to do the same thing. They're not, not going to make, keep their integrity because you supported them when they were just mom and pop out of their house. So just, just go ahead and destroy that notion. Yep. And if you, and I, I, I only because I do this, because um, I am morbid and I think logically, I think that most humans are good by by general being. I think that we do our very best to do the best we can by people around us. We don't go out and try to hurt people, right? The idea that like, oh, you know, um, hospitals don't care if you live or die. They care about making money. I'm like, well, that means you need to live because they can only make more money off of you if you stay alive. Like, you know, the people that don't put their families in, you know, hey, like, I don't want to put them in any sort of like care or nursing home or we're not going to do chemo or we're not going to take this extensive, you know, um, like track of treatment for whatever ailment that we have because we don't trust the intentions. And like, well, I can tell you right now, their intention is to keep you alive because it's the only way to keep making money off of you. If they give you a fucking shot of poison, poison is obviously, I mean, chemo, we understand what chemo does is the body, but, and you die, well, then they can't give you any more. Like they want you to live. Like they want you to go into remission and there's a good chance that you become a patient later on for something else. Like, their job is to keep you alive. If you want to look at money, money drives that. If you want to like try to like attach intentionality to something, I think that that's a kind of morbid, dark way to frame it, but at least it'll make things make sense for you. So then you stop with the, oh, well, like they're just trying to do this, or they're just, there's just some 
dark, undermining, nefarious thing going on uh, in big business and big medicine, et cetera. So um, I think it's just, it is a really, really interesting point. It's just like, if you want to look at it that way, understand that like, it sucks for some people as do most things, right? Like things that fit the median things, or I guess the, the masses, right? The things that work for a lot of people are not going to be great for some others, right? Which is why capitalism, while it can be kind of, it has obviously there's people with strong opinions on it. Um, there's people who are like, hey, like there shouldn't be people making billions of dollars in the same neighborhood where someone's sitting outside and going to starve and possibly die that day. And I'm like, yeah, when you, when you look at it morally that way, that fucking sucks, right? There, there could be better systems in place that I think a lot of those people making a lot of money would be like, you know what? sure like uh, I, we can we can do that if it keeps people alive it helps people yeah but, not and also not to uh not to say anything about the morality of billionaires but billionaires typically do a lot more than your government does to directly mm -hmm. influence helping those situations so yep. let's not get that twisted right you can say whatever you want about bezos but bezos donated more of his own money to the hawaii relief stuff than the u.s government did let that sink in. Like, again, not saying that Jeff Bezos is a good person or he's doing it for for moral reasons rather than like, you know, a fucking tax write-off. Who cares? Who gives a shit? They're still doing it, right? Like you think it the helps people doing things because the government actually cares? No. The government wants more power, so they do things. Like straight up, it's all power games. That who but understand who is actually getting shit done and where the money is coming from. And like like, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like, obviously, like, I think capitalism is is a better system than anything that has been put forth yet. Um, and if someone has a, a better solution, I'm all ears for sure. But I would highly advise not saying that the solution is things that have already been tried and tested and failed miserably in other countries. Again, capitalism is obviously flawed. Yeah. The incentive structure is not perfect, kind of like what we're talking about, right? Like it it drives the profit machine up and then that affects moral decisions downstream. Mm -hmm. But something that I, I found to be a really good kind of like litmus test for, for incentives and motivations, especially whenever it comes to uh, like more conspiratorial type of thinking like what we're kind of talking about here with like you know pharmaceutical companies and um you know hospitals like keeping people alive versus you know like all this shit right um if it affects rich people it's probably not a conspiracy straight up think about it like that if you think that there is some secret there's some secret like elixir that these pharmaceutical companies are holding on to for that solves cancer so that they can give you more chemotherapy you know what? Steve Jobs died of cancer. I guarantee you they would have accepted his fucking money to pay for that magical cancer elixir. Don't give me that stupid bullshit, right? If the richest people on earth are dying of cancer, there is no cancer cure that is being hidden. That's the dumbest shit I've ever fucking heard in my life. What about the Illuminati, Bryce? Well, I, so I'm not going to get down that rabbit hole, but like, of, of course, all right? So there, there, there are going to be Whenever you get into like the upper echelons of power, there mm -hmm. are there are ways that that power coalesces into probably not great ways, because power begets power, yep. and once you have power, you want more power, straight up. Like that's it's that's how it works, right? Um, so that's why you see like all of these quote unquote like secret societies and like these closed door meetings and stuff like that. Yeah, these people are pulling the strings behind a lot of stuff. But whenever we start getting into like conspiratorial thinking, again, litmus test, if it if it affects the ultra wealthy that would be in these clubs, right? There's probably not some secret that they're sitting on that if they were to take this magical cure, that they would just be like, fuck it, we got to keep the secret going. Like Steve Jobs isn't like, no, guys, like you you keep the secret. I'll die for this one. Fuck that. Like that's Steve Jobs' decision. I'm, I'm, I'm joking with you, but obviously that's that. I played a lot of Assassin's Creed and watched a lot of like um, Total Recall and shit like that. You know, those movies where 
there's some agent of the future who's like sent back to make sure a certain person dies just to make sure that it, it fits the timeline yeah. in a beneficial oh, way, yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, and so it's like, hey, Steve, you have to die. I'm sorry, bro. I'll take this for the team. But no, I, I'm not. I'm with you, though. I'm, I'm with you in the way that, like, like you said, the litmus test is if rich people, if connected people, you know, are being affected by it, if they're dying from it, there's a good chance that even if they have better resources, even if they have better doctors, the premise that those doctors are using is titrated down. It's, it's all the same, right? Like, yeah, they might survive that bout of whatever they're facing because of the care they get, but the care and its knowledge base and its access to what is real and what is not real is the same. You know, just because your doctor is not as good as Steve Jobs' doctor or your ability to afford the drugs that that person can afford is not there. The same drugs are available. You just, you know, they're not, they're not for you. Yeah. Just because you tear your Achilles and you can't fly to Germany and get stem cell treatment and get growth hormone and get all these peptides injected into you doesn't mean that they don't exist. Just, just right. means you're not Kobe. Yep. Like you don't have Kobe's money. Like that's the reality, right? Like money opens the doors to things that other people would not be able to access. And that's, that's the reality of the situation. It's unfortunate for sure, but it is, that's the reality of the situation. But again, like if you're, if you're thinking in terms of like holistic versus pharmaceutical, just look at like what really, really, really wealthy people do that have access to the best care, the, the best pharmaceutical drugs, the best holistic measures possible, right? For sure. Some are going to be like swindled into the holistic stuff especially if they can afford the most ridiculous shit in the world, right? Like they're probably going to try all of it, but the majority of them go with conventional pharmaceutical measures, right? Like there aren't very many people, very many ultra wealthy people that they get cancer and they're like going towards holistic stuff, right? Right, right. There's no secret that you think that you have or that your friend who has been doing acupuncture for the last, you know, 30 days, they don't have the secret that other people don't have, right? Like the reality is if something is, or something seems too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true, right? So there, there's trade-offs to be made. Either you, again, like what I said earlier, like you go with holistic measures and you are sacrificing guarantees of results for potentially less side effects, or you go with pharmaceutical measures and you're guaranteeing or quote unquote guaranteeing increasing your guarantee of success, but also potentially increasing your chance of side effects. Yeah. There's a trade-off to be made with everything, right? But I think that especially if you start to talk about like severe problems, the rate of success becomes exponentially more important than any side effects that might come up from that. You start yeah. to you take the side effects if the side effects are less severe than the problem you're trying to treat, right? Yeah. That's not perfect, but it's the reality of the situation maybe bathwater thing, right? Um, I mean, it just, it, mm -hmm. yeah, it just makes sense. Um, I was going to ask, do you have, I know I do, um, and this is like, I don't know if I, an ethos, uh, a mission statement, a subscript for my skepticism and how and where it's rooted. Like the minute I question anything, the minute that I have an opinion on something and I go, I think they should, or why don't they just it's rooted in something. There's a, there's a, there's a same statement I say to myself and I say to others, you want to present that opinion. Hopefully I'm articulating that correctly or in a way that you understand. Do you have that? Do you have something that you're like, this is kind of like my base root. Would you consider that to be it? Like, Hey, like essentially like the, the rich people thing, or is there something a bit more just like base and generic? That's just like, my skepticism is pretty much founded in X. Like this is how and why I'm skeptical of everything that I am most skeptical. Of. Um, yeah. So, so my, my skepticism and things that start like setting off alarm bells in my head are typically going to be like where the incentives are coming from. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's not always visible. It's not always easy to see where incentives are coming from, but you know, for example, right for us. In our case, if we were to partner with a, a supplement company, mm -hmm. we, we, we do. But for example, if we were to partner with a supplement company, 
And we all of a sudden start telling all of our clients to take supplements from X company that we just partnered with. What is the incentive behind that? Is it because we truly believe in those products or is it because we're getting a kickback? The chances are it's the latter, right? That's, that, that's the chance, or excuse me, that's the probability is that if you all of a sudden partner with some new company and then you're just blasting that all over your shit, you're getting a kickback. You're getting paid for that. It doesn't necessarily mean that you actually believe in that product or that it's the best product. Right. You're getting paid for saying that, right? You can say that with any influencer that you see online, if they're doing, you know, like paid ads or if they're doing sponsored posts, they're doing all this stuff, partnerships, doesn't necessarily mean that they believe that that is the best quality product or service. It's just that they are getting paid to say that, right? Yeah. That immediately throws off alarm bells in my head. So that's an easy one, right? Um, I would say another one would be like how easy it would be to test the uh, the results or how effective the results are or how effective the product or service is. So again, kind of going back to like quantitative versus qualitative, if things are able to be measured with numbers mm -hmm. objectively, it's a lot easier for me to get on board with that versus if we're just going by vibes. Yeah. You know, like the latter alarm bells immediately because it's like, all right, this is really fucking easy for people to be snake oil salesmen, right? Like, that's really easy to like spend people and lie to people and mislead people and steal money and be scammers, right? The former, if everything is based off of numbers, if you're presenting spreadsheets, you're saying, hey, this month you improved by this much. Well, I mean, fuck, I can, I can fact check that. I can say, well, right. actually, I didn't. You're lying to me. Or you know what? You're right. I did improve by this much. Or I, I got this much worse. Mm-hmm. Like you can always follow the numbers, right? So not everything will be quantitative, but I think that the more it starts to shift that way, the more that I will be more likely to trust those things. And the more that they shift towards feelings or vibes or holistic or, you know, whatever bullshit like that, whatever, you know, term that you want to use, yeah. the more skeptical I'm going to be because it's just it gets more challenging challenging to measure whether positive results are actually happening. Yeah. No, I like that. Um, I mean, I, I would say mine's, mine's pretty homogenous there in that description of obviously incentive. Um, I said earlier that obviously I believe in the good in people and I also believe people have motive. Um, it's actually why my, <clears throat> my least favorite response from anyone, like I've always said, like if... I show up to the school to pick up my child after doing whatever, right? But he gets detention for slapping the shit out of the teacher. And I go, why'd you do that? And he goes, I don't know. Like, you fucking know. I don't care. You, there's a reason here, right? Um, because I think that's just how, like, you and I's brains work. I think in a way, like, hey, listen, there's a reason for everything. Even if you were unconscious of it or unaware of it or whatever like there's a reason why you're doing things and if you reflect on them there's a good chance that you understand yourself and things around you a bit better so i'm always big on motive i'm always big on where the incentive is possibly coming from where the agenda might lie um i did not articulate my question as well as i wanted to but i do like your answer and the way that you took it i was thinking um to the point of the people who are out there that you know are no offense, but like working their day jobs, they are an insurance guy, they work in retail, they might be a salesperson outside, inside, whatever, right? They just, they work a completely unrelated job to whatever they are commenting on. Well, that's this. I won't do that because why? I won't do this because of X. The government's just trying. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just kind of like, okay. Oh. Um, and I actually will reduce this and say like, I have the same feeling whenever I'm watching sports. Like, especially football, because I'm just very, very well versed there. I've been around for a while, but like basketball, baseball, et cetera. And I'm watching with someone and goes, they're just, fuck, they're still fucking stupid. Da, 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 da. They should just, they should just, they should just. And I'm just like, the fact that it doesn't like just in your head go, there's probably someone smarter 
more educated and more experienced than me calling the shots. <laughs> like just probably someone who's seen what I'm seeing and like that's not their advice. That's yeah. not their direction. And maybe I should just shut up. You know, like, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. I can be irritated. I can say, I mean, I don't know why they wouldn't. I don't know why this. Why would they just? Those are questions, right? But to like, say, well, they should just, or this is what's going on when you, by numbers, have a glaring inexperience. You are vastly outnumbered in your ability to comment on this scenario. Like, there's a humility that I feel like should be immediately instilled in, in your thought process there, right? Yeah. But you have, like, these coaches, people around these coaches, a rhetoric of, like, almost sheer absolutism and this is what's going on and i'm like how do you know like can you tell anyone how you know or are you just spouting shit because it sounds nice because you're kind of like rallying against the system like you mentioned earlier in the very very beginning of this you talked about people being adverse and i'm like i don't know if i agree with that word adverse because i think aversion comes to a level of something has happened and there's a feeling of like, okay, I don't like this and I don't want to be around it anymore, right? But I think the coaches, a lot of them that are out there that are pushing, pushing coaches, people, advisors, consultants, whatever, that are pushing a, don't go this way. Don't go big box stores. Don't go big business farm. Don't go here. Don't go there. Stay out of hospitals. Like those people have an agenda. What's yeah. your incentive? And that's where I'm like, oh, okay, well, wait a second. You're not saying this because you have any factual data as to why they shouldn't. You pickpocketed and chosen the things you want to show, but you have an agenda to sell people and make money, which goes back to the very first segment that we had where it's like, hey, listen, like these people are out here to make money because we're in a capitalist society at the end of the day. And if they can get you to buy their products, not the hospital's product, it's good for them. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that always uh, really bothers me, and I kind of, I think that maybe this is, um, Continuing along with with where your your question was going, but uh, people that bring up or highlight problems without presenting solutions to the problems, um, that's always something that yeah, that's always something that like really drives me crazy. So like for me, I'll be scrolling on on you know Instagram or Twitter, or just you know like being you know pretty mindless, and I'll see people in comment sections just absolutely like roasting the fuck out of you know out of some issue, right? Like some, some issue they're just talking about like, okay, so let's see, um, like Twitter, right? Like let's say that Elon like comes up with, with some, you know, solution to like the bot problem or he does something and like, you know, it, it fucks everything up for some people, but he's like trying to fix like the bots on, on Twitter and people just like absolutely lose their fucking minds about it. Right. It's like, okay, well what, what's your solution? Right. Okay. Like you're presenting the problem, which, you know, there is a problem. I think that most people can identify that problem and they can agree with that problem. What is your solution? Do you have a solution that is better for solving the overarching problem, the problem that is trying to be solved here, that does not bring up more sub problems that you're now complaining about, right? And most people don't. They just like to complain. Most people just like to complain. They like to point the finger and they like to bring up how other people are, are in some way insufficient or or you know unsuited for a job or they're you know morally wrong or whatever 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 right but every decision has trade-offs every decision has trade-offs every decision i make has trade-offs same with you whenever okay so for example whenever we're running a business we will make decisions that not everyone will like right. and we will make decisions to solve a problem that will create new problems but unless someone comes up with a solution that is better than the one that we presented, don't just echo the fucking problems, man. We know, we, we know, trust us, we know. We're the ones that are trying to solve it. So you bringing up the problems is not helping anything. We can discuss them. We can discuss yes. the things that you're seeing that are problems. But let's actually work towards creating a solution rather than you just regurgitating the fucking problems and reminding us of the things that we already know. We know. We get it. We we do. Trust us. Like, I, th I think that's the same thing, right? Like, you go back to, like, the sports example. Like, people just losing their fucking minds about sports or, you know, play calls or whatever. I'm like this, too. 
I, I'm like this. I, I he I, is. He, I, he I, dude. I'm, I'm, Bryce could be sitting down for like 15 seconds into an Ohio State game. Right. <laughs> Kickoff could go 10 yards shy of where you want it. He will lose his shit. I but it's better. actually really, really entertaining. I could do better. Um, <laughs> but, but no, I mean, I mean, that's uh, that is a good example though, right? Because it's really easy whenever you're watching sports to highlight all the problems that you're seeing whenever your team is playing. But could you do better mm-hmm. if you're playing or if you're calling the plays, right? Like if if you're the one that is in charge of everything that's going on, would you be better in that position? Or are you just bitching to bitch? For me, I'm bitching to bitch. I get it. That like that's my role here, right? I'm not doing anything productive. I'm just bitching. But you can say the same thing about, you know, like people that are complaining about every politician's choice, right? Mm-hmm. I fucking don't like politicians. So like do, do not let this feel like um me being sympathetic towards politicians. I, I think that all of them are pretty fucking useless and incapable, right? Um, but again, it's because the incentive system is is created to make them useless. That's the reality of the situation, right? But like, if you're complaining about the decision that a politician makes, but you can't come up with a solution that is better, why the fuck are you, like, what are you saying? Like, be part of the solution, not part of the problem. You echoing problems is being more of a problem. Yeah. You're not helping the situation, right? So again, I, I think that people actually enjoy being part of the problem. I think that's part of part of the issue is that and <laughs> I'm not gonna bring it up, but there are a lot of there are a lot of huh? No, no, no. Like there, there are there are a lot of people that find more enjoyment in criticizing others than they do in actually being productive or valuable people themselves. Right. And I love the internet, but the internet has made that problem very front and center because you can be an anonymous person on the internet and just criticize other people who are putting themselves out there in the public sphere, opening themselves up to criticism, but you can be an anonymous person and just Make that person's life hell, basically. Yeah. And you're not providing any value by doing that. You're literally just stroking your own ego, making yourself feel a little bit more important for two seconds. But that is unfortunately the world that we live in, right? Like, if you're a public figure in the internet age, you basically have to accept that you will get absolutely destroyed. You absolutely will just get destroyed and most people will dislike you for for no real reason i mean some people have reasons for being disliked but like there are a lot of people that just get so much hate for pretty much no reason online other than there are a lot of miserable miserable people online that have nothing better to do than be haters and be trolls right um but you know i i think with that it's just like my my issues and something that like I I probably will never be able to relate to is people that would rather spend their time being destructive versus being productive, right? And they see they see no way that they or their time can add value other than being online and like trying to tear other people down or, you know talk about or gossip about other people or um to like like be so obsessed with like a specific person that they just spend all day writing you know negative articles or negative posts about them i mean you see this obviously with politicians you see this like let's say like an elon type of personality you see this like on the other side like people fucking obviously i mean obviously like biden like trump like all these people like there are journalists there are you know commentators that their entire career is based off of criticizing that person you know that's like that person has created an industry around criticizing them crazy yep. um but and that's not to absolve those types of people but again it's like it does take take a special type of person or multiple people or business or whatever to basically put themselves in the position of criticism and say like all right cool i'm going to continue trying to do my thing while everyone else is criticizing me, while everyone else is highlighting the problems without presenting solutions, right? And yeah, um, 
you know, I, I, we can probably talk again, like the capitalism thing, I think is like, is a pretty clear example of this, whereas like people criticize capitalism without presenting better alternatives and like, no, like, you know, socialism or communism is not a better, better alternative. I'm sorry right. about that. It's not. Um, but you know, people like to talk about and comment about things they have no idea they they're ignorant on, but they have like expert online opinions about all of these things. Right. Like for me, there are things that I know are well without like outside of my expertise and wheelhouse, right? Like I know fucking nothing about them. So I just do my best to not comment on them or I don't feel like it's my place to comment on those things. Right. And we've had humility that should come with like your comment, like, cause you can have conversation about something you're ignorant about. If you come to a, from a learning place, like oh, yeah. you can say like, Hey, I, I disagree with this because this is how I understand it. Yeah. And so maybe it gets explained to you in a way that you no longer disagree with it, or maybe it gets explained to you and you still disagree with it, but now you disagree from a more intelligent, more knowing position, more educated position. And I think that's a really important piece. And, you know, it's funny because obviously M deals with this a lot. Um, and she and I, like we, we talked about it and the thing is I see stuff that she posts and I'm kind of like, eh, like if I was a kind of person who was just like lazy and just wanted to hate, I could hate on this pretty I mean, easy. Too. Right. I could, I could definitely do this. Right. Like I'm like, yeah, I see that I, I'm easy to hate on. I'm sure to like people see me singing in my car and I'm like this guy. I'm like, yeah, but I'm having fun, bro. I'm living my life. And fortunately for me, I grew up with a dad who hurt my feelings way more than any of you ever can. So at the end of the day, like I'm, I'm perfectly fine. Like do it, like bring on the trolls. I'll just play KD and hop in this shit and play um, when I want to. And then I can just exile it from my mind when I don't want to. And unfortunately for like her, it, it does weigh on her a lot more. Right. Um, it's one of those things where like, you, you deal with it for, you know, almost a decade, like that shit's going to, you know, weigh on you. I don't think it comes from, for her, a place of like weakness or inability so much as it is like, like just volume, just sheer yeah. volume and time for the people who do it. Like you said, there are people out there that have made livings off of this, but it started because less about the person and Hey, look at me. Like think about Skip Bayless. Like what do yeah. we know Skip yeah, yeah, Bayless yeah. for? Well, yeah. he loves the Cowboys and hates LeBron James. Yeah. Not anymore though. Right. Because it's not, it's not popular and riling to hate on LeBron. People have accepted his greatness. He's no longer in, you know, dispute there. So now right. getting on TV and saying that he's not great doesn't get you any likes, doesn't get you any views. People don't give a shit anymore. So we got to find someone else to hate on. I think it's easy. I think people, again, to my point earlier, are generally lazy, but people want to feel smart. Like how many times have we, I mean, we know people that like, speak up and say something in a conversation that they surely are just like unequipped to be there. Like there's like, nah, wait, you, do, you do not have the goods to be speaking on this right now. Like you should just be listening, but they want to talk. They want to feel not the thing that they're feeling inside. Like they, they feel dumb. They feel like they don't know enough. And so like, well, I got to say something because if I say something and get some sort of reaction, then the collective kind of makes me feel like less of a moron. But like, we'll call it like the, this moronic collective is lazy. And it's a lot easier to sit back and go, that's stupid. It doesn't work. And it's like, well, yeah, it's easy to pick up problems. But you didn't look any deeper to find a solution. You didn't look any deeper to find anything else. And so when you have people who want to feel important, they might bring something. Like there's, there are things that I've seen on Reddit about M's content that I go, I kind of agree. I wouldn't have said it that way, but I kind of agree. Yeah. But I can go to her and be like, hey, babe, like, what if you did it this way? It might be taken, like, you might be able to get more people to see where you're coming from on this. And it might just augment your ability to put out content that appeals to more people. Um, not so much that it needs to get away from, like, I said, fuck the hater. Like, they're going to be there. The hater, they mean they're doing something well. But at the end of the day, they might be pointing out something problematic in the way that you present a topic or the way that you're presenting some content. And so you can take something fruitful from the fucking idiots and say, oh, okay, maybe there are a few people out there that are missing my message. So let me, you know, reorg this a little bit. Let me go ahead and set this up in a way that it can, you know, be a bit more easily palatable, digested, et cetera, by more people. And so um, I, I think that is honestly where it comes from. I don't think that people generally just want to hate on people. I think people want to feel important and it's really easy to feel important to sit back, look at America and go, this country is problematic. It's like, well, tell us something we don't know. 
you know, like, like it doesn't make you like super enlightened or whatever, but that whole going against the grain thing, like, I don't know. It was, it was a thing and I heard it more than once, but I remember being in college. Um, and there was a, a girl that I was talking to just like randomly at a bar. She was friends of friends and we were watching, uh, it was Sunday. We were watching all the pro games and she goes, I just, I hate pro football. And I was like, huh? interesting and like i was just kind of curious like i'm like why and she's like i just feel like the players aren't as good and i was like as as good as another time in pro football yeah. you know she's like no like as in college like i feel like the players in college are just like better you know like the games are like they're more competitive they're more fun da, 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 da. The, the players are just better and i'm like you understand that the nfl is a titration of like the best of the best college right like the best athletes the best players go to the nfl but yeah, I just feel like it's all politics is not good. I'm like, oh, you want to sound smart. And that's what I said. You, you want to sound like you know what you're talking about. Like you, you have no idea what you're talking about. College football is more fun for you to watch because you're more invested because you go to Ohio State and it's fun to go to the games and go, I know these players. I go to school with them. Like that, that I can take. But you, you what is that statement? But the thing is, like I've seen people go out and say shit like that. Specifically that statement. People go, yeah, yeah. Like I, I'm just like, wow, you're all idiots. Hey, this is actually kind of amazing. Like this, I, I just want to sit back and watch now. Most people are idiots. No, I, I like if, if you if you come to any conversation or come to any any interaction with the base assumption of this person is an idiot. That sounds fucked up to say, but I'm going to say it. You will most more often than not, you will end up in a better position than if you were to assume that that person was a genius. Like, let people prove to you that they're fucking smart and they know what they're talking about. Don't assume that they are smart and know what you're talking, know what they're talking about. Same thing with, with experts. Like, let's, let's bring it all back. Let's bring it all back. <laughs> Same thing with experts, right? If you go into that assumption, whenever you are with your doctor and you assume that they are fucking stupid, make them prove that they know what they're talking about. If you're on a call with a coach Make them prove to you that they know what the fuck they're talking about before you pay them money. Like, again, but it's also questioning versus asking questions, right? You don't have to question someone to ask them a question and get that proof out that they know what they're talking about. You ask questions in a way that allows them to prove to you that they're capable, that they're knowledgeable, that they're worth paying money to. We don't have to be a fucking dick about it, right? So again, that's for me, right? Like I go into pretty much every interaction with the assumption that this person's a fucking moron and I can't trust them. That seems fucked up, right? It seems fucked up. I am, I would actually consider myself to be mostly like a pretty optimistic person about like people in general, but I think it's a lot easier to start from the position of let this person prove to me these things versus going into it with the assumption that they are those things and then being let down or getting fucked over, getting scammed, right? Let people prove to you that they're worth it, that they're, that they're worth your time, your money, your your energy. Because then, then you'll know, you'll know, right? Like it's so much easier to operate from that position versus being disappointed by having your expectations shattered. Yeah, I was going to say that unpopular opinion, you actually do the other person a favor because if you go in assuming a relative base of understanding or right. can do, and then you're let down, the chances that you interact with that person in a way that's going to be favorable to either of you is going to, it's going to go down. I was, um, it's funny. It, it sucks because I wish I would have just said it in that moment. I read I wrote it down and forgot to come back to it. This is probably a future podcast talk. Cause I think it's actually a really good talk, but it came up with the idea of people just pointing out problems, um, especially moral problems. You know, people just going, eh, that, that hurts their feelings or that, that leaves out this person or those people. Um, transgenders in sports, right? I, I remember having um, this okay, conversation. You got to tread carefully now. Oh, yeah. And, yeah all right. Um, no, but I think it's an interesting conversation, right? I think it, it lends itself in a very interesting conversation. And I remember having this conversation with friends. Um, and I was actually very shocked at who answered the way they answered when or who defended what points. Um, but, you know, I mean, obviously, I, I not obviously, I, I do not believe that there is a, a place for transgender athletes in this segmented sports. I believe for a myriad of reasons that it, it's a tough play. And it's not because 
I don't like transgender people. It's because there are inequities that will be created, especially in the female space, um, that are very unfair to the athletes who this was their space that you're trying to infiltrate now. So um, with that being said, though, I think a lot of people point out the glaring problem of like, well, this leaves out a group of people or this marginalizes a group of people. And as a minority, yeah, as a, yeah, as a minority, I know. And I thought about that when I thought about what I believed to be based on my knowledge base, both scientific and anecdotal, and then also just how I feel. I understood that to be a problem, but understood that the idea in my mind that I presented was the best for the most people. And not because it's like, oh, well, this is it and I'm done. But it's like, hey, like, we might need to find another solution for another group of people. However, I don't think that potentially hurting another group of people to make another group of people happy is good, right? Like, I don't think that we should break a system down that is already running and, and running well to include a, a people that may kind of damage the space just by mere existence. It's not fair to either group. Like they shouldn't be marginalized in that group when they show up because they're different. We should create a space that is their own because this kind of works better in my mind. But I do care about this group of people and I want them to have the same opportunities and the same involvement and ability that everyone else has. I just don't think that possibly invading another space is that space. Um, but obviously, like I said, it's a very controversial topic today. Like we understand, like we've seen a ton of different things about it. We don't have to dive completely deeply into it because I don't know how much time you segmented for us to talk. But I do think that that's a a very interesting thing that people are just like, hey, that's a problem. It's like, well, we know, but like, what what do you want to do about it? Well, yeah. I'm one, so just before we kind of wrap everything up, I do want to just kind of quickly touch on that. So like for me, I without me presenting my opinions on this, um, I I would like for for debates along controversial lines like like that like like transgender trans transgenders in sports um like like even like pronouns and stuff like that right like things that people vehemently disagree with or have differing opinions on i would just like debates to be approached from a non-emotional position because if one side or both sides are approaching those conversations from emotionally volatile or heated positions, nothing is going to get done to bring the other person closer to an understanding with you, no matter what your position is, right? So like for me, and I, I'm not going to go on the sports aspect, but I, I'll, I'll touch on like the pronoun stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm obviously not transgender. I'm obviously not gay. I'm white as fuck. All right. So I have a lot of things that are going to, that I would say, make it very difficult for me to understand the positions of people who are marginalized or are minorities. Right. Because I, I don't have to experience those things in my normal life. Whenever someone approaches me or whenever I've had a conversation with someone about like pronoun uses, use stuff, right? Like, dude, I'll call you whatever you want. I don't give a shit. Tell me what you want to be called. I'll call you that. I don't care. I like, I, I care about what would make you like feel good right. about yourself. Like, and it's no extra effort for me to call someone whatever name, whatever pronoun they want to be called by. I don't care. I don't give a fuck. Right. Like, again, it's it's not, it's nothing more for me. Nothing more for me, right? Whenever it starts getting a little bit more challenging is whenever people approach those conversations. It, well, well, let's just say on one side, right? Like mm -hmm. if, if you're someone who is very, very pro, um, you know, like transgender rights, which I, I think that that's not necessarily, that's not a bad thing, right? Like that, that's not a bad thing. Um, but kind of like what we've talked about with any good thing typically gets pushed to the extremes. Um, and I think that that's where there has been a lot of pushback with, yes, there are people who are transphobic as fuck and like that, right. fuck, them. fuck them, like that's yeah, shit, fuck them. Fuck, them. fuck them, right? Same thing for like people who are, are homophobic, fuck them, like they're, they're, they're shitty human beings, but it also doesn't make you transphobic or homophobic to at some point say, all right, are the things that are being asked of me from this movement making my life harder? Right. Or making it more difficult for me to operate, right? 
And then at that point, again, it incentives, you say, all right, does that person have an incentive now to push back on this movement? If women are being asked to use the same bathrooms as a, a, a transgender woman, then the incentive, there is an incentive for that woman to say, I don't agree with this. Right. That doesn't make her transphobic. It just means that there is something else going on there that would incentivize her to bring up that complaint, right? Mm -hmm. And same thing for a father who has a daughter that is being forced to use the same locker rooms as a transgender athlete. That father has an incentive to say, I don't agree with this. Or a father who is watching their daughter have to wrestle a transgender athlete or play a sport with a trans. That doesn't make the father transphobic. But they have a, an incentive to bring up a complaint. But again, it's like if everything gets bucketed and thrown in the same, that same like bucket of transpho transphobic or homophobic, then all of a sudden it starts to dilute the real transphobia and homophobia that does exist out there, right? Everything that's a complaint is not extremism. Yeah. Every disagreement is an extremism. Mm -hmm. It's not racism or xenophobia or transphobia. It's not. Like that's the reality of the situation. Like I can disagree with aspects of these things without me being an alt-right extremist, right? Like right. I think that that's where where my position here comes from. And it's like, if you can have a conversation with me about why transgender women should be able to compete against biological women in sports, and if you have that conversation with me and it's approached unemotionally, laying out the facts, laying out the benefits, laying out, you know, the cons of the situation, um, you know, like potentially where this might go, like what the repercussions of all of this might be downstream. And it, we had that conversation back and forth. And if you make good points and you can sway me to your side, dude, more power to you. Awesome. That's how conversation should be had. But if you come at me telling me the things that I need to believe when I have to agree with you, otherwise you are X. Like, does that not, do you not understand how like people would push back against that, right? Yeah. People don't like being told what to do or what they have to do or have to think. It That necessitates pushback. We've been ingrained to push back against that. And we should push back against that, right? Like that's indoctrination. That, that's what that is. So again, and, and this is, it always, I feel like at the, the end of these conversations, I always start getting out to like on the periphery of what we should be talking about. But like, I think, you know, for us, we can always just kind of come back to the fact that like it, approaching anything from the position of like controlling your emotions is always the best position, right? That is where you're actually going to get the most productive work done is in an unemotional, calm state. And if you can't, then don't have a difficult conversation. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I think obviously fitness is, is why we're here. It's what we run, but I think these are they contextualize everything, right? Even the way we run our business, the way that we coach, I think, is contextualized by the way that we see the world. Um, especially, like, I think there's a, a lot of overlap between you and I, um, and, which is cool because we come from very different backgrounds, like uh, similar family nests, um, but very different perspectives, different parts of the country, different populations, obviously different skin color. I, it's, it is super interesting. And like, I do, I'm going to do your thing that, Two things, two things, one thing. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I should say, I have gone back and forth in my head on because I, I, I should say also, I have developed an entire scenario, an entire reworking of the sports structure of the oh, then I sent to OJ, but like I was back in Ohio, but the entire just nation, especially high school sports structure, in which transgender athletes would be able to compete in their desired you know, gender specific side, right? I've run that out. I'm like, this is how that would have to work. And I'd be okay with this. If this worked this way. I'd be okay with this. And it has everything to do with like blood panels and hormone testing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of, lot of money and a lot of oversight that obviously we just could not do. 
but that would make you feel really comfortable in knowing that there was an evil, even playing field out there. But it goes back to the reason why I think it's an interesting conversation, especially in fitness space, is because it goes back to like the steroids and tested and untested federations and things like that. So that's why it is so interesting. I will, I wanted to say that and then I wanted to pivot into just for clarity, myself as a minority, and you and I have talked about this, I do believe sometimes emotional context gives more logical understanding, but they should not run a conversation. They should not detract from the ability for a conversation to move forward, and they should not incite any obstacle, right? They shouldn't be the reason that things can't keep getting better. Um, I have always used the analogy, you know, I was okay with the fucking burning down of the fucking the police department, right? Like I was scrolling Twitter and I saw that shit on fire and I was like, yeah, fuck that piece of like, but then like we talked about it, like the, like obviously like the looting and shit of all the stores and we know it wasn't just black people, but like the idea that, Hey, like let's just fuck anarchy. Like let's just go in and just like smash stores in and steal shit and march and not go to work and da da da, da blow things up. That wasn't okay. Right. That, that wasn't okay. And what I looked at and I saw, I told a lot of my friends, black and brown friends, some Asian friends, honestly, as well. Um, and some of them understood where I was coming from. Some of them thought that I was being a Uncle Tom or whatever they wanted to call me. And I was like, hey, listen, like, I'm a numbers guy. There's more of them than there are of us. I'll tell you where we're not going to win. Them on their rock, standing and shouting. Us getting on a rock, standing and shouting. Like, nothing is going to happen. Because right now... If we're saying they have something that we want or they have or they're gatekeeping something that we need, us standing on our rock and chucking rocks over and screaming as loud as we can is not going to bring them to the table. So you can look at that in whatever sort of moral lens and go, well, that's just not how it should be. Well, Albert Einstein says a wise man sees what is and not what it should be. And this is what the fuck is like. This is what it is. If you want to talk to somebody. You can't go yell at them and call them names and tell them that they're X, Y, and Z and tell them that if they don't do this, then they're this or whatever. That's that's just not going to get them to do what you want to do. That's just not that's got not good people skills. So to your point in anything, like you said, back to the experts, back to disagreements is in this space, controversial topics, et cetera. Like it is very, very important that they are had in an era or a space of humility. They are had in a space of respect and understanding of like, hey, like I'm not here to talk i'm actually here to understand and in talking we will get there agreed agreed all right let's wrap this up i had a pee so bad i got a pee as well um sweet well no we opened up obviously a lot of different topics that you know who knows we may come back to some of those um thank you again to everyone who tuned in this will probably have to be broken down into like a part one and part two um, we'll want we'll to find a good spot there. Maybe we just do my mind first and then Bryce's second. But thank you again for tuning in on whatever platform you are. Make sure you hit that subscribe and like button, comment for us. Let us know what you thought. Let us know um, if you have any questions or or thoughts as we continue to, you know, create these. Um, we will like obviously diversify the installments, but we, we do tend to like these and it seems like you do as well. So thank you again for showing up and we will see you next time. 